Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Happy Wednesday. Happy hump day, as I like to call it. We are officially getting over the hump this week, and that's always a great thing, especially after um, a holiday a holiday weekend. Um, my name is Shay Parker. If you are not familiar with me, I am one of the co-hosts on the Quicksilver Morning Show on 92Q Jams in Baltimore. Um, and welcome to our Radio One um, Building the Health of the Community um, live stream seminar. I'm really excited um, about tonight because we all know it's freezing outside, right? If you had to step outside today, <laughs> Hopefully you had your coat on, you had your scarf, your boots, earmuffs, the whole nine, because baby winter is not on its way. It is officially, officially here. Um, and we all know that with the winter season um, brings the flu, brings the cold. And I know some people like to think that it's gone away, but um, it also means COVID and just taking those taking those precautions that we need to take to keep our family and ourselves safe. So tonight's live stream is all about remedies to protect yourself from the flu, the cold, and COVID. Um, and again, it's just a friendly reminder for what we can do on our end. I know sometimes it feels like there's so much going on in the world, um, especially when it comes to our health. Sometimes those things can seem like they're out of our control. Um, but tonight, I would like to encourage you as well as our guests to really just take your health into your own hands um, and do what you can from where you are to protect yourself. Um, so we're going to hop right into it. I know we've all probably had our own experience with um, all three of these um, these things, the flu, cold, and COVID. Um, so it's something that affects everyone, no matter where you are, but especially us here um, in the Baltimore region. So I am going to introduce our panelists. First up is Dr. Jeffrey Gerbino, and he is an internal medicine specialist at the University of Maryland at their Midtown campus. He is also the medical director of Midtown Health Center Primary Care um, and a very um, great person to be on this live stream with us today um, because he takes a special interest in understanding understanding how psychological and social factors can affect our health. And Lord knows we love a doctor um, who makes that a part of his care. His philosophy is that everyone should have access to high quality medical care, no matter their race and no matter how much money they make. And he believes in shared decision making when it comes to figuring out what the best treatment is for his patients. So again, a great person to sort of lean in on this conversation about what we can do as individuals to protect ourselves and our family. Thank you so much, Dr. Gervino, for, for joining us tonight. Thanks, Shay. Happy to be here. Yes, thank you. Now, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Williams. Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> and she has an expertise in pulmonary and critical care medicine with a clinical focus on advanced lung diseases, um, especially ILD. Now, her work combines her love of helping patients and her interest in exploring the forefront of science. She's been very involved in figuring out if we can get a vaccine, right, for ILD. Um, so I know you're probably super heads down into that work, very much so needed. As part of a holistic approach to treatment, she also participates in a support group for patients and families living with advanced lung disease. Um, now, Dr. Williams' research is currently focused on therapeutics and outcomes in ILD, um, and we are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yes, yes. Now, the flu, the cold, COVID, these are three words that I think probably scare people to death deep down inside, especially considering, you know, the past couple years that we've had really battling COVID, trying to figure out what it is. Should I take the vaccine? Should I not take the vaccine? Should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? And so I know I have a lot of questions. Uh, we have a set list of questions that we're going to go over. But I encourage those of you in the audience who are watching right now um, to be a part of our conversation. We want to make this interactive and we want to make sure that we are doing our best to answer the specific questions that you have surrounding these things. We know that health is wealth. That's what my grandma always used to tell me anyway. Um, and the older that I get, the more I'm realizing that that is absolutely true. 
<laughs> so first things first, we're going to start with um, the flu. And Dr. Jabino, I will throw this one to you. Um, now, growing up, I always got the flu shot, always, no matter what. Um, and then a couple of years ago, before COVID hit, um, I got the flu shot and I ended up getting sick with the flu three times. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, but then after um, the pandemic and the brunt of it, I did end up getting the flu shot again. Can you talk a little bit about how important it is to get an annual flu shot? Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's a good point. Um, I'll address that just in a second. So the, the flu shot is it's really important because there's not much we can do once we actually contract the flu. Um, you know, getting, getting it helps to prevent the severity of the illness, uh, can protect you from getting it completely. And uh, like I said, it's, it's one of the only things that we can do to prevent getting the flu. Uh, it's important for people like us who might be in good health to get it as well, because, you know, for instance, myself, I have two little children and me getting the flu shot helps to protect them from getting the flu. So if I were to get sick with the flu, I could pass it on to them. So I get the flu shot to protect my kids and the patients that I see um, to decrease the spread of the flu. So it is very important. Um, what you had mentioned is, is actually a, uh, a question I get pretty frequently from my patients. They say, hey doc, I, I got the flu shot, but then I ended up getting the flu anyway. And I think we have a better understanding of the general population since COVID. You know, vaccines aren't perfect. Um, and you can, still can get sick after getting the vaccine. It's not 100%. But what it does do is it gives you a baseline level of um, you know, protection against it so that if you were to get flu, maybe you feel some fevers and some cough and some aches, but you're not ending up in the ICU. So I think that's the important point to make. Nice. And is it something that you know the whole family should be getting? Um, should there be any things that we should consider when thinking about you know, very young children or even you know, those, those members of our community that are older? Yeah, especially especially if you live around young children, pregnant women, older people with lung disease. Um, if you do care about them, uh, I would really urge you to get the flu shot because, like I said, it helps to protect you from getting it. And if you were to get it, you could easily spread it to other family members. Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Williams, feel free to jump in here. Um, I know this is probably a question that a lot of people <laughs> that a lot of people have on uh, whether they have health insurance or not. Can you get the flu shot for free? And if so, how can I go about doing that? That's a great question. I think that uh, for a while, um, I'm actually going to ask Dr. Jabini to help me with this. For a while, all of the vaccines were free at most of the local pharmacies. I believe that they are still doing flu shots for free. Um, I believe this is not your question that you asked, but COVID um, is now requiring a copay, if that's correct. I don't know, Dr. Gerbino, have you found something different? No, I think, I think that's true. I think you can, um, uh, you can get the flu shot. I know Baltimore does the, uh, department of, uh, the, the public health department. I believe you can get some of these vaccines for free. Um, flu, you can, you can get for free. And even if you did have to pay for it, if you didn't have insurance, it's, it's not the, the world's most expensive vaccine. Um, there are scattered around Baltimore also federally qualified health centers um, for people that don't have insurance. They can, you know, go there. And, and a lot of these places, their policy is pay, pay what you can to receive the care that you need. So um, there are, you know, places where people can go if they don't have insurance. That's great information. Thank you so much for that. Um, we actually got a question um, in our chat as well from the Urban Informer. Um, is it true that they inject a variant of the flu in the flu shot? So that's a, a good question. Um, so what the flu shot actually is, it's a, um, some, some proteins that are on the actual um, flu virus. It's not the actual virus. It's not what we would consider a um, live um, inactive virus uh, vaccine. Uh, it's it's a part of the protein, so um, it's impossible to get the flu uh, from the flu shot. Um, what you might feel after getting a flu shot, you might have some tenderness in the arm where you got it. And then you might also feel a little bit under the weather, 
uh, for 24 hours or so. Some people get that. And that's your body's immune system kind of recognizing those proteins and building up the immunity so that if it does see the real deal down the line, it already has some knowledge of it to help protect you. Awesome. Awesome. And a follow up question to that. If I decide, you know, to get the flu shot for, you know, my family and I, are there any symptoms that I may experience that should concern me or that I should, you know, seek medical attention for? So it's very normal right after a flu shot in the first 24 or even up to 48 hours to feel, as Dr. Gerbino mentioned, achy, sometimes even a little bit of fevers. Um, your immune system kind of ramping itself up. If you start to feel um, short of breath, that would be a little bit atypical for just a, in a vaccine reaction. Um, so you would want to talk to your primary care doctor about that. Or if you notice these symptoms are going on for longer than two days after your shot, um, even the fevers and the achiness, you might want to just reach out and talk to your um, talk to your primary care doctor about that. Okay. That's great information. Thank you so much for that. Um, and moving a little bit into, you know, the difference between all these, these things, the flu, the cold and COVID, because I will be honest, I feel like this is just my personal opinion here <laughs> and talking to my friends and my family. I feel like now whenever someone gets sick or they're feeling under the weather, now, instead of saying, oh, I have the flu, I have a cold or I have COVID or RSV, RSV, they say, you know, I have a bug. I don't know what it is. It's something. Everything is going around. Beats me. <laughs> what are some of the different symptoms um, that differentiate between the flu, cold and COVID that we could look out for? Yeah, so I think I think the term flu used to be. Uh, thrown around for any old illness, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean influenza. So influenza is the virus that causes it, and, and flu symptoms are typically, you know, rather sudden onset of, of fevers, body aches, um, a cough, you know, maybe shortness of breath. Um, sometimes you can have some, you know, stomach upset. Uh, it's not uncommon to have that uh, nausea, vomiting, um, and those same symptoms can be, you know pretty, pretty um, identical to COVID, especially when it first started. Um, so it was hard to tell the difference between them. And really the only way sometimes to do that is to do the testing. Um, the co cold symptoms, you know, typically it's more of runny nose, congestion, sore throat. Um, oftentimes it doesn't have a lot of the um, achiness or high fevers that COVID and flu do. So that's one of the main ways that we can tell it apart. But but in all honesty, sometimes they, they all look exactly the same and, and talking and being evaluated um, by one of us is, is and getting tested is really the only way to tell the difference. Yeah. And I would add that some patients who have underlying conditions, especially underlying lung conditions or a problem with their immune system um, or diabetes, can tend to get some of those higher fevers, even from these what we call common cold viruses. RSV or any of the number of viruses that your friends say, I don't know, I got a bug. They're right. <laughs> we don't know. They got a bug and without <laughs> doing a swab in their nose and, and sending it off to the lab and having the lab tell us exactly what that bug is. A lot of them can look pretty similar. Okay. So I guess the, the best answer to that is just to be safe. If you feel like you have something and the symptoms are a little bit more than a cough, cough or a sniff, sniff, then get tested. Is that fair? I think that's fair to say. Awesome. Okay. And when when do you know that you need to get medical attention? Whether it's, you know, an emergency room or urgent care, or maybe I need to actually make an appointment with my primary care doctor. I'll be honest, I never necessarily really know what to do. It's more so, okay, how urgent is this? Do I need to go right now? Or do I have time, you know, to get into my primary care doctor? Is there anything that we need to consider when making that decision? Yeah, so I, I think the, the most concerning symptom to me, and, and Dr. Williams might agree sometimes, is you know, if you're getting that really short, short of breath with pretty minimal exertion, say I were to stand up and walk to the bathroom by the three steps, I'm completely out of breath. That would definitely be something that you need to seek medical attention for. Um, some of the other things, you know, if you do have underlying lung disease, underlying conditions, um, 
uh, and you're having you know fevers, feeling under the weather for a couple of days, it's it's probably a good idea to reach out to your doctor um, so they can discuss it in more detail. Um, like I said before, there's not necessarily medications to make these things go away like that, but there are some things that we can do to help kind of lessen the severity of the disease. Um, and, and talking to your primary care doctor, or your pulmonologist, um, you know, they can go over those options. Yeah, I would add two things. I agree completely. Um, the first thing I would add to that is I always, always would rather hear sooner than later from my patients. Um, I get phone calls all the time that say, hey, your patient's in the hospital because of X, Y, and Z. And I say, how long has this been going? I go see them and I say, how long has this been going on? And they say, oh, like two weeks. And I said, then why didn't you call me two weeks ago? We might have been able to keep you out of the hospital. Um, and so I'm always happy to take those phone calls. And maybe the phone call ends up with me saying, I think you're fine. Don't worry about it. But at least we've had the conversation. Um, so it never hurts to have the conversation. And then the second thing that I would add in terms of thinking about seeking emergency care, um, if you're ever to the point where you are having nausea and vomiting and you can't keep anything at all down, um, there's a big risk for dehydration. So that would be another clue um, with GI symptoms more so than respiratory symptoms that we would want you to get evaluated in potentially urgent care or the emergency room. Okay. Nice. Now, is, is it possible for, okay, if I get the flu, is it possible for me to then get COVID at the same time that I have the flu? Or can I get a cold and the flu and COVID at the same time? Have you ever seen a case like that? Yes. That's <laughs> <very fine. laughs> yeah. It's not the most common presentation, but there are absolutely patients who um, can be what we call co-infected um, with two viruses at once. And COVID and flu can co-infect or COVID and RSV or any of the viruses. Um, if you're exposed to them and they uh, are able to come in contact with your respiratory system, they can start replicating and then you have the infection. Wow. And so in that case, um, how is that treated? Um, I mean, <laughs> what do you what do you even do? Is it is it a matter of, you know, making sure that whatever medications you have are, you know, treating everything or not, you know, harming you more than they're helping you? Um, so as Dr. Chirpino said before, we don't have a lot of um, super effective treatments against the flu um, and against COVID. We do have some antivirals that target both of them. Um, and if I had a patient who had both of those, I would probably offer them antivirals to target each of the of the viruses. Um, there is a likely a tendency to be a little bit sicker if you have both viruses. And so that might end up happening in the hospital, depending on how the patient's feeling. Yeah, and like Dr. Williams said before, let us know, let your doctor know sooner than later, because both of those medications, the sooner you start them, the, the better typically. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, now, if you've had COVID before, um, which I'm sure, you know, many of our audience members probably have, I know that I have, if you then get the flu or the cold, or maybe you even get COVID later on down the line, um, are you more sick the next time around? Can you be more sick if you have COVID and then, you know, contract the flu or maybe the cold later on? So, so nothing's ever 100%, but generally, let's say you had COVID last year and you got it again this year, um, you know, the best the best protection that you your body can can get is actually having the disease in the in the past. So um, you have that. That's why it was so severe in the beginning, because it's a new virus. Nobody's um, immune system ever saw it before. So it was just spreading rampant. Every Nobody had any protection. And now probably you've seen you know, people aren't necessarily getting as sick as they did um, in the first wave of COVID. And that's mostly because, you know, maybe the virus has changed a little bit, but also most of the population has some level of protection either they got it before, they've gotten the vaccinations. So, you know, if I see that COVID again that I got last year, my body's like, oh, I've seen this before. I know what to do to fight it off. Um, this specific for COVID, um, the flu as well to a degree, but, you know, as you've probably heard in the news, these things do change over time. The virus mutates and kind of um, uh, picks up some 
uh, ways to kind of sneak through our immune system, um, but there is a level of protection from having it before. Okay, great. That That's awesome to know because I definitely feel like when I got COVID, um, those probably like six months afterwards, everyone around me was sick and I was like, woo, I'm not. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, doing a little bit more, more research, just knowing that since, you know, the virus had already been in my body that I had a, a bit of protection there. Um, so if any of our audience members are wondering about that, there, there's your answer. Um, interesting thing, how science works though, and medicine, like the best protection against something you don't want to have is to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So don't go that's like exactly running the through the science. hospital and that's exactly the science trust. behind it. <laughs> Um, now if you, what is, what exactly is long COVID? Um, because I feel like when the media was talking very heavily, um, about COVID and who should be looking out for it the most and who has what, and you know, how many people have lost their lives to this disease. We heard a lot about long COVID. What exactly is it from a medical perspective? From a medical perspective, um, from a very technically from a scientific perspective, the answer is we're still trying to figure that out. Um, from a medical perspective, some people after they have a COVID infection tend to have um, symptoms that are different than, than the COVID infection symptoms that last a very long time, six months to a year um, or even longer. And those symptoms are different for everyone. They can be a lot of different things. They can be breathing symptoms or heart symptoms um, shortness of breath, fast heart rate. Some people have stomach symptoms like upset stomach or pain um, or diarrhea for a long time after they've had COVID. Wow. A lot of people complain of neurologic symptoms or brain symptoms. So brain fog. I just can't think as clearly as I did before I got my COVID. Um, sometimes headaches um, come on that last for a long time. And so the constellation of symptoms that make up long COVID for any one person is going to be different from from their neighbor and the way that we figure it out is kind of just putting the clinical picture together and say hey you didn't used to have these symptoms at all then you got covid and now they're going on and and it's hard for us to you know they've been hard for us to get rid of and so that's kind of what long covid is Wow. Okay. And so that's something if you do have it, then it probably will take a little bit of a time for you to figure out that that is something that, you know, you're, you're suffering from. Definitely. And it's definitely something to, um, if you're not feeling back to yourself after your COVID, it's definitely something to talk to your doctor about. Um, and they probably would do some tests and make sure that there's nothing else going on before just blaming it on long COVID. Wow. Okay. So th this is why it's so important to listen to your body um, and take, you know, whatever signs seriously, even if you feel like I know as patients, um, we know our doctors are busy, right? And we don't always want to ask the questions or take up the time or come into the office for something that we think, oh, it's going to pass, you know, it's just diarrhea. And then, you know, you have diarrhea for three months, you know? Um, so that that is really good to know. Um, what would be your suggestion to people who, you know, are part of the black and brown community? Um, we know that in the medical field, feel, a lot of us can feel like we're not being listened to um, or that, you know, we may be in pain or we may be experiencing certain symptoms that, you know, our doctor or, you know, primary care providers are like, oh, you're fine. Oh, you know, it's not that bad. And it does end up being that bad. What are some of the things that we can do as minorities to make sure that we're asking the right questions um, and to also make sure that we are getting the answers that we need when we ask those questions, especially when it comes to flu and the cold and COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think I it's a good point. This is your specialty, I mean, Dr. Jamil. Yeah, um, you know, you need to advocate for your health. And, and sometimes that means speaking up and, and questioning your doctor. Um, Sometimes that means finding a new doctor, to be honest. I mean, if you feel like you're seeing somebody that's not listening to you and not hearing you, that might not be the right fit. Um, you know, we all have different personalities and, and sometimes finding your, your primary care doctor is all about that fit and that connection. 
Um, sometimes it means bringing somebody with you to your appointments that can help you advocate for yourself. Um, you know, nobody knows your body better than you do. Um, so speaking up when things are wrong and, and letting, you know, letting your doctor know like, Hey, like, this is not, this is, this is different. This is not, um, right. Something's going on. Um, whenever somebody tells me that, and I, I know like I need to take them seriously. Um, not that I wouldn't anyway, but you know, I always tell my patients like, Hey, you know, your body more, better than I do. So um, I'm going to listen to you. Dr. Williams, anything you wanted to add on that front? I agree with everything. You have to be an advocate for yourself and what that's whether you're white, black, brown, and anyone um, coming into the healthcare system um, needs to be an advocate for their self. And that's easier said than done sometimes because in a, in a sitting in a clinic visit with a doctor, um, sometimes it's hard to speak up and say, actually, I don't think you heard me right or uh, whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes my patients write things down and they come in with a list of questions that are written ahead of time um, that they don't want to forget. And I find that that's helpful for them um, because there's often something on there that they said, oh, you didn't ask me about this. And I wanted to let you know that this has been going on. Um, and it's something that's really pertinent. And so I think it's helpful to go in prepared, not that you have to bring homework to every doctor's office you go to, um, but it's helpful to go in prepared knowing that these are the things that are important to me and that I want to cover. And obviously the doctor is going to have something that's important to them that they want to cover and you should be able to kind of get through all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I know that's going to help someone, someone out there for sure. Um, now when it comes to the flu, the cold and COVID, um, are there any subsets of the population or certain individuals who are more susceptible to these things? Um, if you watch the news at all, they, you know, of course, what would have, you would have heard that those who are elderly, you know, should really, you know, make sure that they're protecting themselves from COVID or those who have pre-existing conditions. And um, I do believe just judging from, you know, our listenership on the radio, on the radio that um, a lot of young people just felt like, oh, okay, this doesn't concern me or it's not going to impact me, you know, as much. And many times here in this good old country of America, when something doesn't, you know, affect someone directly, they don't take as much care in, you know, protecting themselves or others against it. Um, so what would you say about the individuals who are more susceptible than others or not to the flu, cold and COVID? Yes, yeah, so definitely people that have underlying conditions that affect their immune system. Um, and, and that could be certain medications they're on, uh, that could be certain diseases that they have. Um, even things like diabetes can affect your immune system, which is a pretty common disease. Um, we saw with COVID, you know, people that had those pre-existing conditions and high blood pressure, and even those that were overweight tended to, to have um, more severe symptoms. Um, and COVID, if you've followed the news, it unfortunately affected our elderly population more than, than anyone. Uh, so, so age is a major risk factor for all of these diseases. Um, and like Dr. Williams had said, you know, any underlying lung disease, you know, COPD, asthma, um, the chronic lung diseases like that, you can certainly have a, a, a more severe course and, and get yourself into trouble from getting these infections. I'll add pregnancy to that list. And, and you said a lot of young people feel like it doesn't affect them. Um, Pregnancy is a huge risk factor for getting sicker with these viruses than, um, than you might otherwise if you were a healthy person before your pregnancy. Um, and even if you're having a healthy pregnancy, it knocks down your immune system. Um, and Dr. Gerbino had mentioned early on in the broadcast, I think that even if you're not the one that you're trying to protect, that everyone that you come into contact with is, is going to be at risk if you have COVID. And so if you want to protect the people who you love, the children in your house, the grandparents who you visit, um, I think that even if it's, you're right, a lot of people don't think, oh, well, it's not gonna be that bad for me, then I don't have to worry about it. Um, but you might be protecting someone else by avoiding COVID, getting vaccinated, whatever the case may be. Think about grandma is what think she Think about said. grandma, that's right. <laughs> Um, now, for, for the flu, cold, 
um, and, and COVID. I know this is probably the question that's in everyone's mind. Should we still be wearing masks and should I still be making people stay six feet away from me? That is a <laughs> good I, I question. I think we should have kept the six foot rule. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to keep it for other reasons, but yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's it, at this point, I think it's a, a personal decision for, for most people. Um, you know, if you, uh, you know, I, I tend to wear a mask uh, when I'm seeing patients, especially some of my elderly um, patients that are, you know, maybe at more risk. Um, cause, cause we've all heard sometimes you even have asymptomatic COVID where you can have the virus in you and not really feel any symptoms. So to decrease the spread, um, wearing a mask could be helpful. Um, you know, be smart about it. Use common sense. If you're going to go, um, out into a big crowd of a hundred people during, uh, in cold and flu season and you have asthma, it might not be a bad idea to wear a mask. Um, so I think it's a personal decision and everybody has that, that right to, to determine what's best for them. Yeah. Um, now also when it comes to, you know, just talking to our family members about, um, you know, COVID flu um, or, or a cold and even maybe so about getting, you know, a vaccine, do you run into any situations where you have patients who, you know, are really trying their hardest to protect themselves and their family is just, not on board. And again, you know, I know you guys are on the medical side of this, but sometimes you probably are counselors or therapists at the same time too. Do you have any suggestions, you know, for those of us in our community who are dealing with sort of that um, clashing of perspectives when it comes to the people we live in the same household with? Yeah, I... Um... <laughs> the sigh <laughs> it is that is a tough one because you know you're hearing you know hearing different perspectives um uh, you know you might be getting one some information from your doctor and then you go home and your sister is saying something completely different um so you know not to say that we are the smartest of the group um but but we did go through pretty extensive training to kind of build this knowledge base and, and give these recommendations so um you know our job is to give people this information and, and what they want to do with it is their choice. So, um, you know, I, I try to give people the accurate information that's out there and let, let them make the decision for themselves. Um, and, you know, there's myths about COVID shots and flu shots. And I try to just explain the science behind them and, and hopefully break it down to them in a way that they understand, um, not use big medical terms, but, um, you know, just give them the information that they need to make the decision for themselves. Okay. Now I have a pretty controversial question for both of you. Mm -hmm. Feel free to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say has been one of the biggest myths or lies told um, to the overall public when it comes to um, COVID? that you may have heard over the years that you really hear often just in your, you know, daily care of patients that you feel like, all right, people, let's just bust this myth all together. Mm. I, <laughs> I, I've heard a lot of people say that COVID at its peak wasn't really that bad. Um, and as a we're talking a lot about my role here as a pulmonary doctor in pulmonary clinic, but I'm an ICU doctor too. Um, and I think that the, the myth that I would like to bust is, is the myth that COVID wasn't really that bad because it was very, very dramatic what we saw in the hospital when um, at the peak of, of the pandemic, when it was really um, spreading quickly. And so I just, I would want people to know that it still, it, it was and still can cause very serious illness. Um, and I think the reason that we're not seeing it to the degree that we did two years ago, three years ago, um, is the rate of vaccine. And so I hope that, I know that people are starting to get a little over the vaccine. It was kind of fun at first. And now um, the rate of vaccination with the new bivalent vaccine that has come out recently is a little bit lower and it's less, uh, I think it feels less urgent to everyone. Um, but I think the reason that it doesn't feel urgent is because so many people got vaccinated at first when it came out. And so I would hate for people to lose faith in that 
I think it made a huge difference. Dr. Gervino, do you have do you have one? Oh boy, uh, I plead the fifth on that. Um, <laughs> what, do you do you have one, Shay? Can I reverse this one on you? I do, I do. One of my favorite ones that I will never forgive the public for ever is that the vaccine was a part of some government 5G conspiracy of 5G rays coming through our cell phones. And <laughs> this shot is one way to take us all out. That was, that <laughs> must have been my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah, the internet is a wild place as we all, as we all know. <laughs> um, Yes. Now, moving a little bit away from um, the flu and cold and COVID for a second, what is this RSV thing that we've been hearing about? I guess for you know those of us who are not medical professionals um, and don't have the the expertise, what is it? Yeah. So RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, um, it's another virus that can cause similar symptoms, um, and it's become more you know, popular in mainstream media, people are hearing about it more. Um, and uh, it can cause typical cold symptoms, but it also can lead to a more severe, uh, lower respiratory tract infection, uh, particularly in, in babies and older people. Um, so uh, up until recently, you know, there wasn't that much we could do for it in terms of prevention. Um, but just this year is the first year that there's actually a vaccine for RSV. Um, so, you know, in the past, because we couldn't really do anything, it's like, okay, well, you have it, let's just kind of treat your symptoms and support you through the infection as your body fights, fights through it. Um, but nowadays, there are ways to prevent it, which is why it's getting a little bit more attention. Okay, and, and can you be tested for it at this point? Okay. Yeah. Yes, so absolutely. We talked about putting that little swab up in the nose and sending it off to the lab. That looks for, that swab looks for COVID, the flu, RSV, and then about 16 other viruses that you mentioned earlier that just call, we call the common cold. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and so we can test for RSV specifically, as well as all the other common cold viruses that kind of sometimes hang out in the community. Now, I'm sure there are probably folks who are watching this who are today years old in knowing that there's a bunch of different illnesses <laughs> that we just call the common cold. Out of my pure curiosity, does that number fluctuate? Like over the years, do you find, you know, other viruses or illnesses that are, I guess, under the common cold umbrella? Yeah, there's a little bit of fluctuation. For example, um, there's a there's a virus called parainfluenza, which despite its name is not the same as, as the flu virus. And I think now on our panel, there are four parainfluenza just numbered, number one, two, three, and four. Um, and there didn't used to be. So I think that we are seeing new viruses that kind of pop up and, and come and go uh, in terms of their prevalence or, you know, how much they're spreading through the community. And one year versus another. Um, none of them have gotten the attention that that COVID or the influenza virus have gotten because they don't tend to cause quite the severity of disease. Okay. That's that's really good to know because I'm like, what? 16? <laughs> I might as well just stay in my house, but no, 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 no. <laughs> I know we can't. As long as you wash your hands and stay around people, stay away from people who are uh, feeling sick and having cold symptoms, then you're probably going to be doing pretty okay. See, that's the part, Dr. Williams. People are not out <laughs> washing their hands. <laughs> it is a major key. I think that was probably one of the biggest things that I saw during COVID of just how many people were not regularly washing their hands on a day-to-day -day basis. So wash yeah. your hands, stay six feet away from people. <laughs> <laughs> and also wear your mask if you if you feel comfortable. Um, now, Dr. Jabino, going back to RS, RSV for a second, um, would you say that the main difference um, in figuring out if that's something that you may have versus a common cold would be the respiratory effects? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, they can look exactly the same. Um, it's, uh, you know, something that, you know, only really the test can, can say whether or not it's different. 
Um, but, you know, it does set you up to, if you have those underlying conditions or uh, older, to get a more severe infection. Um, and really, it's, it's a big problem for, for infants in their first year of life. And, and that's who it affects uh, a lot. And, um, you know, we want to protect those, those kids. So, um, you know, getting, you know, doing what you said, washing your hands, you know, covering your mouth when you cough, trying not to be around, you know, the elderly or the little kids when you do have those symptoms is important to, to decrease the spread of it. Yeah. And as a follow up question, if, you know, there are any, you know, parents out there, young, young children who are watching and listening, um, if their child does get um, RSV, what does treatment look like for them? Well, I'm not a pediatric specialist, but I do have uh, two kids under the age of three. Um, so it's, you know, there are some medications from what I understand. If it, it does get severe that they can give, but a lot of times it's, you know, watch if they do have that severe infection, it's watching them in the hospital. They know they need to have oxygen, um, breathing treatments. Uh, so it, it could be pretty scary if your kid does, you know, get RSV and, and has to go in the hospital and needs to be put on oxygen. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty scary thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm leaning a little bit away from RSV back to um, COVID. Is there anything, you know, just from being in the world that you work in from a medical or scientific perspective that people should just be, you know, keeping their eye on when it comes to the future progression of COVID? Is this something that we're going to have to just live with and deal with forever? Is COVID always going to be around or is this something that's, you know, going to eventually go away and maybe come back in a couple of years? And we don't know is also a perfectly fine answer. Mm -hmm. too. <laughs> I would say I think that COVID is here to stay. Um, I think that we probably, if people continue to get vaccinated the way that they did um, initially, will not ever see a COVID wave the way that it was at the beginning. I think what we're going to be looking at is COVID that acts like the flu, where it kind of, we don't see a ton of it over the summertime months. And then wintertime comes, we all gather indoors in close quarters and we start sharing respiratory viruses. Um, and I think that the recommendation, and this, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think the recommendation will end up becoming something akin to a yearly COVID shot the way that we have a yearly flu shot. Okay. All right. So just because I got it one one time or, you know, got my, my doses complete doesn't necessarily mean that I won't have to get the vaccine again, essentially. Correct. There's a little bit of... Um, shift in the variant that circulates every year. And I think updating the vaccine to match the, the variant that's circulating in the community is going to be the best way to kind of keep yourself from getting that, whether it's influenza or COVID, that virus. And Dr. Jabino, working in, you know, the, the outpatient clinics, um, Dr. Williams, feel free to answer this as well. Um, aside from, of course, you know, making sure that we're washing our hands and, um, you know, staying away from anyone who's sick or if we're sick, staying away from people. Is there anything that we can do to help um, our medical professionals that are in the field taking care of us? Is there anything that we can do to help you all help take care of us? Um. Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, no, I mean, let us know how you're feeling. Listen to your bodies. Uh, tell us when something's off. Um, you know, listen, not, listen to our recommendations and kind of, you know, try to, try to do your best to stay healthy. Um, I think in terms of primary care, the thing that you can do uh, – to help us is, is all those healthy habits. I mean, you know, if you start off and you're exercising, you're getting good sleep, you're, you're eating well, um, you, you prevent those conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure and you keep your weight at a healthy level, you know, you're going to have, you know, a healthier life, uh, and, uh, you're not going to be at as risk of having severe illness than, um, from getting these infections. So, you know, all those things that I preach to my patients every day, you know, exercise and 
eating more fruits and vegetables, that sort of thing will, will help in the long term. Unapologetically, Moy, um, in the chat, I love the be proactive. That's the part. Proactive versus reactive. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, no, that's really what it's all about. I mean, if you want to live healthy, enjoy, uh, enjoy life and not have to suffer through some of these chronic conditions, it's starting early when you're young, when you're in your 20s and 30s and building those good habits. Um, you know, set, set yourself up for success as you get older. It's a lot harder to do it you know, in your 50s or 60s when, um, you know, you've been living that way for uh, 10, 20 years. It's hard to change those habits sometimes. Yeah, and I'm sure those watching can relate to that. We all were with our family over the holidays, and I was constantly <laughs> on my mom about how much sugar she was eating, like things with red dye in it, yellow dye, like She's like, can you get off my back, please? <laughs> um, same thing with, you know, some of some of my friends and those I love. So I I try to be, um, you know, honest, like mm -hmm. maybe don't eat the whole box of oatmeal pies. <laughs> maybe just eat one. Um, but also balancing that with not being, I guess, overbearing. Um in a sense. So are there any other things that we can do naturally? I'm one of those people where if I feel like I'm going to be under the weather, I get my green tea, I'm like burning turmeric, I'm boiling natural oils and water. <laughs> are any of those things like elderberry or sea moss, are those things actually helpful to us from a medical perspective? Or are those things that just kind of help ease our own minds? Well, I think if it helps to ease your own minds. In, in that sense, it is helpful. Um, there's, you know, with a lot of these supplements, there's not a lot of great scientific evidence that they're helpful for some of these conditions. But, you know, if they're helping you mentally and helping you feel better, then and not hurting anything. Um, you know, I think that that says something. Okay. Dr. Williams, anything else to add on that front about the natural remedies of <laughs> I really the natural that. remedy the, thing, the common ones that people like to, to say when you have a cold are vitamin C, right? I yes. remember when I was growing up, I got a sniffle and I would have a glass of orange juice set in front of me, chug this. <laughs> um, and vitamin C and zinc is the other one that I've heard a lot of. They're, I would say there's limited studies. And some of them say that maybe these are helpful we don't know what that means because we've talked about the common cold. We've talked about the sniffles. Who knows? It doesn't change your immune system to take those right away. But I agree. If they're making you feel better and it's kind of making you feel like you're taking a step, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's no studies to say that there's a magic pill. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My pessimistic so approach. Yeah. My, my pessimistic approach is if, if a lot, of, if those things really did help that much, Unfortunately, the greedy pharmaceutical companies would have found a, a way to to make billions of dollars off of them. Um, yeah, good point. Points were made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, for those out there who do not have a primary care provider, um, you know there are many people who urgent care, the emergency room, is sort of their first line, you know, of defense. They don't necessarily have a primary care doctor. Can you talk about the importance of having one of those? So I may be a little bit biased uh, since I am one, um, but I think it's very important because, you know, you have a primary care doctor, they know you hopefully over years, they know what medical conditions you have. Um, so they know how to best kind of uh, approach treatment um, and, and they know your body um, and, and your health conditions. Places like the emergency room um, aren't necessarily the best place to go when you're sick if it, it's not an emergency. Um, you know, those doctors there have a, a pretty uh, specialized skill set. Um, so they're looking for the things that are going to make you really sick, um, cause a lot of, um, you know, make you be hospitalized and, you know, potentially save you from dying. If you come in there with, um, you know, cold symptoms, but you're not having fevers, your um, breathing's okay, they're going to say, okay, well, you're not going to die from this. You don't need to be in the hospital. So go talk to your primary care doctor. Here's a medicine or two that might help you feel better. So I think um, having that relationship with primary care, because um, we do that stuff too. I mean, you know, if you're my patient uh, and you start to have these symptoms, 
give, give us a call. We get you in uh, hopefully within 24 hours. I talk to you on the phone. We can get treatment started if it's needed and keep you out of the hospital because nobody wants to be in the hospital. Um, you know, there's other sick people there, so you can catch something else while you're in there. Um, so it, our goal is to kind of keep you at home and, and keep you healthy at home. Yeah. It goes back to um, the comment that said, be proactive. I think getting a primary care doctor while you're feeling healthy um, is the time to do it. And they can help you uh, set up a plan for yourself to be proactive and stay healthy before it ends up being, a, I don't feel good. I'm going to go to the emergency room or the urgent care. Yeah. Um, are there any disadvantages to um, like switching primary primary care doctors? If If someone is, you know, switching primary care doctors every two or three years or so, does that muddy up the waters a bit versus, you know, sticking with, you know, a primary care doctor that you're comfortable with over, you know, a longer period of time? I mean, ideally you'd have the same doctor from age 18 to 80, um, but, uh, you know, that's not realistic. Uh, people move, people's insurances change, unfortunately, and they have to switch because of those reasons. You know, doctors are people too, and we switch jobs. Um, I, I do think there is, uh, you know, a, a benefit of seeing the same doctor for several years. Like I said, you know, we know we know you and, and we know the conditions that you have. And, um, you know, I, I have patients that I've known for five plus years and, you know, I, I, I know what they're, they're dealing with when they get sick and know how to, you know, get them feeling better. Nice. And for those who are listening and watching um, at home on this live stream, feel free to pop in into the chat with any questions that you may have. Again, of course, we want this to be an engaging, interactive conversation. Shout out to Mia Glenn, Unapologetically Moy, Urban Informer, um, for tapping in on, on the chat. Um, as we continue to talk, feel free to put your questions in the chat box, and we will try our best to get to them before we close out at 8 o'clock. Um, going back a little bit into the um, primary care um, provider um, conversation here, um, I know you two are, are primarily, of course, with the University of Maryland Medical Center, and you work a lot um, at the Midtown campus. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, the Midtown Health Center and the Center of Pulmonology work together? I'm assuming this would sort of be, you know, you two, do your past, you know, ever cross, or how does that work? So I'm up on the 10th floor and I think Dr. Williams, you're down on the uh, ninth floor. Ninth floor. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice. I mean, I think uh, we had just moved up there last year. So the outpatient tower has been open for about a, a little bit over a year now. Um, and it's, it's great for patients. Um, it's easy to get to. Um, there's parking in the um, uh, parking in the building. You know, there's primary care up on the 10th floor. There's a lab up on the 10th floor on the ninth floor has cardiology and pulmonology and the kidney doctors, nephrology. Um, down on the eighth floor, you have uh, endocrinology and the diabetes doctors down there. And then on the seventh floor, you have uh, ophthalmology, which is the medical eye doctors and uh, the infectious disease doctors. So I have patients who, you know, they might have, you know, diabetes and chronic kidney, kidney disease and um, all their doctors are right there in the same building. So, um, you know, we can, if we share a patient, we can easily um, talk with each other either through, um, you know, the secure text message that we have through the hospital, um, the medical chart. Um, so it's really easy to, to have your, all your doctors under the same building um, because it's easier to coordinate things. We, we know what's going on in the other people's specialty. One of the things that has also changed since we've all come under the same roof, which has been really great, is there's been a big push to um, provide same day care if needed. And so if there was ever a time that Dr. Gerbino had a patient who he thought really needed to see a lung doctor today, it's easy. Um, there's a number sitting on every computer in our workstation that says same day appointments, call this. And it gets you to any of those specialties that he just listed. Um, or if I said, hey, I need, I really need them to see an eye doctor today for whatever reason, or a, a heart doctor, I want it to, to happen now. Um, we can make that happen. 
Um, our testing is all under that same roof also. So my, um, what we call PFTs, the lingo, the breathing tests that I get for all my patients, they happened right down the hall from me. The cardiac imaging happens right down the hall from us. And so it's, it kind of is all pulled together where we're intended and it's working really nicely to work together and to kind of coordinate um, and get patients to flow through more easily. That's really great. So the University of Maryland Medical Center is a great place to sort of get everything you need uh, or most of what you may need under one roof. You don't have to travel too far or go to another lab for testing, um, because I'll be honest, especially as a as a busy <laughs> radio personality, I'm like, so I have to go where for the lab work at what time and where is it at? And then I got to come back here. <laughs> spark I know, it, it's spark once and get it all done. And then you, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so complicated these days in healthcare. It's if you eliminate trying to find which building you need to go to, where to park, how to get here through the hospital, you know, mm -hmm. if you eliminate that, you know, that's, it makes things a lot easier. Yes, it's definitely a, a, a major <laughs> chunk of the battle right there. Um, and even more so, um, you know, finding specialists and just being able to easily get to them, especially those in our community who may not have, um, you know, transportation of their own or someone's bringing them um, or they're taking public transportation. Um, if you are on this live stream right now, listening and watching, um, the University of Maryland Medical Center has a wealth of resources, services, programs, um, technology, the whole like that can assist you with with whatever you're dealing with, um, even if it's outside of um, the flu, the cold, or COVID, and you know it, it's really right in our backyard, especially if you are in in the Baltimore area. Um, so make sure that you visit ummidtown.org. You can also call 410-225-8000 for more information. And don't feel like you have to memorize that. Of course, you can Google their website as well as the information scrolling right across across your screen here. Um, Dr. Jabina and Dr. Williams, is there anything else that you would like to add to our conversation tonight about flu, cold, and COVID? If no one took anything else from this conversation, what's one thing that you each would want them to leave with? Uh, talk to your doctor, get your flu shot, uh, make the right decision for you and your family. I was gonna say, I know I sound like a broken record, but get vaccinated. It really makes a difference, and um, we like <laughs> we like to protect our patients from from those really severe outcomes that we've seen in the unvaccinated population. Yes, and the good news is you're not going to be injected with five G <laughs> or whatever y'all are saying. Not that, we, not that we can tell you about. 5G. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much again, Dr. Javino, Dr. Williams. Again, they are both at the University of Maryland Medical Center at the Midtown campus. They move around a bit, um, but primarily at the Midtown campus. We appreciate your time. Um, and if you don't hear it enough throughout your daily work, we just want to thank you for your service and being great professionals and experts and taking such good care of us, even when you know, we don't take care of ourselves in the best way that we should. So thank you. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Awesome. This live will be available to replay and to view again. So um, for those who are listening and watching, if you have any family members or loved ones, friends, co-workers who would really benefit from the information that we provided tonight in this conversation, please feel free to um, send them the link to this. Thank you so much. Have a great night and have an even greater week.